in, in in America's democracy, that's not how it works. We're not in America's democracy. <laughs> I can shoot force bolts out of this stick I bought at a store. <laughs> I can call down a flame sphere. A flame sphere. You know how much a flame sphere costs in the United States of America? It's like $80,000. <laughs> I can do that four times a day. <laughs> Welcome to Monsters and Multiclass, your weekly Dungeons and Dragons fix. I'm Kevin Odie. I'm Jared Bornigal. I'm Will Milton. And we'll be hanging out with you for the next hour to talk about anything and everything D&D related. This week is the Bard Rogue Multiclass, and then later on, the Gibbering Mouther from the Monster Manual. So pull up a chair and stick around. To cut you off real quick. So I, I just want to point this out. Nobody's listening would obviously know this unless I specifically say it. This is now a, a recording session. We recorded three here. So we did a recording session where I got the intro first time every single time. It's never happened. Oh, wow. Woo! You're awesome. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, I feel yeah. like we did turn just, down the bullying today. Yeah, they're just kind of glaring at me angrily. I don't... I was why aren't you happy about this? I... I we're getting better at it. Any of your achievements just make me sad. <laughs> it's not enough well, for me mean. to win. I know. I know. Others have to lose. <laughs> um, All right, do your thing. Yeah, I'm sorry, Kevin. That's that's good. You have gotten better at it. That's yeah. great. I'm proud Thanks. of you. Yes. Um, hopefully, I can do a better job at uh, introing our classes today because what we've got today are the Bard and the Rogue. Uh, bard are the musically inspired, entertaining full spellcaster rogues the sneaky uh underhanded campaign ruining playing of humanity it's yeah um <laughs> did i go too far yeah oh okay um you yeah also, you, you missed the most important thing opportunists opportunists that, that's what really ties all the rogues together not all of them are sneaky and underhanded mm-hmm. they're all opportunists that's fair yeah you got a good point so Rogues are opportunists. Bards are cool. entertainers. Entertainers. <laughs> See, we're getting better at this. <laughs> <laughs> that was so smooth. It's great. Yeah. I should be a bard. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So two pretty different classes, uh, but I think we're gonna find some some nice overlap. Who's got some first thoughts? Somebody make eye contact with me, Kevin. Oh, you made eye contact. Go for it. Eye contact stuck. Okay. We're going to have to stare at each other the entire podcast. This is just really bad stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I don't know what I'm doing. All right. Um, Bard Rogue. It, there's, I think this works really, really well. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, I think it works really well. There's a lot that could be done here. There, there are even... Now, you said they're different, and I guess if you kind of describing them on paper, they sound different, but they're really not that different the bards they are full spell casters but they have plenty of subclasses that kind of give them this uh, melee or ranged attack sort of flavor to it which fits perfectly with the rogue in that sense they kind of both have this flavor of being light fighters they're not going they're not waiting out in the battle in full play it's taking all the hits but they can be involved in in fight and martial combat using ranged weapons uh finesse weapons stuff like that Wearing light armor, being hard to hit, being opportunist. That's both describes Bard and Rogue in a way. I, I think there's a lot here. Yeah, no, I, I definitely. Will? I think both are uh, a little obnoxious. Um, <laughs> they have their thing as they do. Um, sneak attack. One thing, uh, this is very meta, but at a table, both are a little bit on the disruptive side. They have, uh, a lot of them do have reactions. Uh, Bardic Inspiration, for instance, is one of those things that you hear yelled a lot by bards at tables. Like, Bardic Inspiration! The DM's just like, all right, give them the die. Just <laughs> And then you've got rogues who uh, always have a handful of dice that you're like, all right, yes, you get sneak attack. It's... There's a lot stacking up on with, with them, but I think overall, mechanically and flavor-wise, they do really mesh together well. Yeah, and I'd say the first thing that comes into mind is just how many skills they both get. Oh, oh yeah. my God, this is a skill monkey full, just through and through. Bards already, they get uh, jack-of-all-trades at level two, Yeah, um, which lets them get 
their proficiency bonus in every skill that they don't have proficiency in uh, Half, halved. Yeah. halved. Um, so you know, your proficiency bonus is plus two. You get plus one to everything. That's a good start. It's nothing crazy, yeah. but it's good. Keep in mind, that also applies to initiative. It does. It's some people forget about it a lot, but yeah, which is nice. That's yeah, that's yeah. So then, by nice. like, once you get up to proficiency six, you get a plus. Even skills you're not proficient in, you get a plus three in, plus then the you know whatever your ability modifier is. Yeah, it's nice. So I mean, like right out the gate, that's that's great. Um, so both of these classes get expertise, uh, which allows them to choose two skills that they can then add their. Uh, proficiency bonus to a second time if they're already proficient in it right so we're talking you know even at low levels here uh plus six to some of your skills uh, yeah. about that um and that's four skills um i think bards get it at level three rogues get it at level one they get it right away at level one yeah that's crazy i'm almost positive there got it open i might as well yeah look bards get it at three there's Looked at that. Yeah, expertise level one for rogues. Wow, okay. Yeah, so just right out the gate, like, you've got a ton of skills. And yeah. I've never played a skill monkey before. Uh, we talked about the knowledge domain cleric. Uh, right. Definitely gets that. But this mm-hmm. is, like, no no prep, no setup. You just yeah. walk into a situation, and you're like, uh, yeah, I think I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Every and, time. And, and both of the classes, when you, when you you regardless of who you start with, part of the initial you know, build this class you get a decent amount of skills right um so rogues get i think it's uh four to choose from and thieves tools uh bards get four three and yes. they get a musical instrument and some other stuff but bards can just choose three of any skill uh and it doesn't matter so if you're yeah. starting with a rogue you get four from a list that you got to choose from it's a big list it is a big list yes and a good list and then you switch over to bard for your multi-class and you get to choose one skill of any kind Mm -hmm. uh then you get to also uh take a musical instrument that you're proficient in which is good not extremely great but it's something uh your background's going to give you at least two proficiencies as well so i mean that's like yeah and often your race does as well (laughs) often especially if you're like half elf which is the perfect race Mm -hmm. for this i think they get two bonus skills (laughs) oh yeah yeah no i I don't i don't read up on the races as much as these so i might be wrong on that but i'm pretty sure just two free bonus skills yeah i think humans can as well can't they they get a couple humans get a few yeah, um, yeah. They're, yeah. they're very open half yeah. elf half human half the rogue, important thing is that there's a, <laughs> there's a couple <laughs> classes that just or races that just let you choose more proficiencies and i mean it just is crazy you're gonna have right. a couple of things that you're not good at and it's probably going to end up being frustrating for you uh, at a certain right. point where you're like, wait, I only add three to this. <laughs> <laughs> and then don't forget about reliable talent. It's not till lo- level 11, but you take. Um, Isn't that a floor? Oh, it's 10? just OK. Yeah. Whenever you make an ability check that lets you add your proficiency bonus, you can treat a D20 roll of nine or lower as a 10. So that's a minimum the, of 10. That's yeah. the rogue feature. Yeah, correct. I thought you had to pick the talent. So that's why I got confused so, reading it. It's just if you if you're proficient in it. I actually had a question on that um so trades yeah how does that play out with it i so to explain the confusion here um jack of all trades lets you add half your proficiency bonus to every skill that you are not proficient in reliable talent specifically says when you add your proficiency bonus you get to treat a roll of nine or lower as a 10 now the first thing i think is well you don't you're not using your full proficiency bonus you don't get to use that for everything but it says use your proficiency bonus it does not say a skill you're proficient in any thoughts on that it seems a little it it does seems like bad wording it seems like bad wording to me i think that's a a raw verse rules as intended type thing i would say jack of all trades does not trigger reliable talent um it just seems kind of unbalanced that's i totally literally you cannot roll less than a 10 yep that's insane yeah (laughs) on anything ever (laughs) any imagine check okay no i mean like in life imagine (laughs) you just like do a thing and no matter what it is you're average horseshoes average basketball average typing average just Doing like with no training flips, or you, dedication. You're not even just average, though. You are at worst average and always a little bit better. Like every year you you'd want to go to the Olympics. Because yeah. like half the events you're going to really do well at. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. just statistics. Yeah. I, and like, again, you're, you're going to get um, even if. So ignoring, let's say, 
we're all in agreement. Jack of all trades does not trigger reliable talent. I agree. I think that sounds a little, little too much. Um, but you still have proficiency in like up to eight skills. Oh yeah. And that's absolutely crazy. And in those skills, um, at higher levels, so at, you get four to start with, um, your expertise that you double your proficiency bonus in. We're saying at 11th level rogue, you now are getting a minimum roll of 10, uh, with a minimum of, I don't know, probably like plus six. So you're basically getting like a low roll of 16 to all of your skills. Oh, <laughs> it takes till 11th level rogue and third level bard. So level 14. But at that yeah. point, you are a really, really powerful skill monkey. And you also get, oh my God, another expertise at level six with the rogue. Oh, so geez, you get yeah. another two skills you can choose from that you get to double your proficiency bonus in. And I think at, at level great. 14, you might be um, getting your proficiency bonus up to, what do you got? Um, level 14 is going to be plus five. Plus five to your proficiency bonus. Yeah. So if you're doubling it, you're getting plus 10, which means your minimum roll becomes 20 on any skills you're proficiency in. You're proficient. So this is like all well and good. <gasps> but, <laughs> and here's the big but. Okay. There is, I, I think there is a gulf of skill use that's just not a lot of campaigns don't bring it up i won't say they don't bring it up i'd say that usually you stray away from trying these things because you're like well i'm not good at that exactly like, yeah I'm, if you are good at these things you're going to try and do it more often it's kind of you, your ability creates the need for it what do you do as a dm do you just make ridiculously high dcs that ruins the fun yeah, doesn't no. it like you just you just let them pass yeah a lot just, of yeah. stuff which is is fine and dandy, but then we get into this realm of like, well, if you're not going to fail, why am I making you roll? Uh, you know, it, it can... Uh, that's like a psychological thing. Totally. If totally. you really don't want them to fail, but you also want to keep that tension there, you're like, yeah, just roll. Right. It just, it, it gets to a point where it's like, everything you do now has a DC of 25, because you're proficient in that skill, and if I want you to fail, or have the possibility of failing, it's still a very low amount i mean you have to roll like a under a 15 but regardless yeah. you know it's like it just makes it tough on the dm sometimes when you've got skills getting to that yeah point. but i would just allow it i would allow them to pass most of it yeah and, and that's fine and like sometimes unless it makes sense that something really is a dc 25 or dc 30 which does exist mm -hmm. um but if you think about it the player the character put a lot into getting to that point. Yes. I mean, at this point, they're already level 14. They had to multi-class kind of this perfectly thing with picking... The, like, they had to build the character around doing this. It's like, not like they have sure. a bad character at that no. point, though. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> but this is definitely one of the major things that is just... It is a totally out-of-combat thing yeah. that this class benefits from. Yes. Right. But uh, one thing I will say, though, is the charisma style ability checks are always tough. Because with a party that does not have someone who has crazy persuasion skills, that's like kind of a deal breaker. And I think a lot of DMs will err on the side of if the player can convince me, the character convinced me. Right. And right. I don't disagree with that necessarily. But if you have this character that is a skill monkey, and if you do focus on persuasion, and that makes sense, charisma bard. Right. Uh, it depends on how your DM plays it. I will always uh, try and still leave the the dice to it to an extent. Like even if a player does really well, I just might give them advantage um, yeah. because that's the only way to really balance it. Because you're right. There are times when it's like that's a totally convincing argument, but you still just have to like accept that. OK, you're trying to persuade me. So let's see how persuasive you were. I, you know, it's there's more to charisma than the words you speak. Yeah, and exactly. I think that's important. And you have to just accept that if if somebody has. Uh, I guess really high charisma in, I guess it'd be in real life. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that. The point is it's, are you saying it's someone who's not like silver tongued? They're not as smooth, like the, the actual person, the player, but right. they, they're playing a level 20 charisma Bart rogue. Right. Who's really persuasive. And like, they're not going to be able to sit there at the table and say things so smoothly and such as myself. I want to treat them yeah, fairly. Yeah, we're stumbling right. out trying to explain right. this. Just I want to treat them fairly. That's yes. it. Each, just because a player, another player might be better at actually persuading me in real life, I don't yeah. want them to get a benefit to that 
too much of a benefit to that. Yeah, it's just like what then what the Marshall thing. We're not asking the barbarian to demonstrate a deft hand axe swing, right? And all right, go run into that wall and let's see how you kind of absorb that damage, and then we'll I'll judge how much resistance <laughs> you actually get on that bludgeoning attack. No, yeah, this, this, that's the yeah. unique thing because D and D is all speaking, and charisma checks are speaking. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's the one thing we can All actually right, do. Bench 250 or you don't, buddy. It's right. <laughs> no, I'm an office worker. I'm not a barber. I'm here to pretend to be able to do that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it, 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 in terms of some people say that disincentivizes people to actually role play at the table. And I just, it just comes down to fun then. Like if you enjoy doing that, if that's how you have fun, and I know that that's how we have fun playing it, then sure, go on the speeches and do things in characters and really dive into things and all that. And it will still come down to a role, which kind of sucks, but what it's fair. It's how it plays. Yes, Cause yeah, exactly. you don't want to be punishing people who can't do that, who don't have fun that way. 100%. Yeah. 100%. I'm not going to give you my, uh, my lock pick set and say, <laughs> well, pick this lock for me. And then I'll give you advantage. Like yeah. that's you know, it's a little rude. Um, <laughs> the dude who knows how to pick locks is also playing a cleric, and suddenly he's the only one who can pick locks. And like, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, he keeps picking the lock. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's the weird thing about D and D. You do have to sometimes just say, "All right, it's a roll." I mean, what yeah. happened? What happened? Doesn't matter. But right. Yeah. Right. This is what actually yeah. happened. Yeah. And if you want to justify it from a RP perspective, as you said. There's more to per- persuasion and charisma than the literal words that you say. Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. Yeah. And like a, it's in a weird way, if you are in real life very charismatic and you are playing a low charisma character and you say something really well and like articulate a very intricate point and get the message across in a very persuasive way, you're doing a bad job of role playing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not I that, feel like, personally it's a, attacked. <laughs> it's, it's not something that I would specifically punish, but it's still going to be a role. Yes. So that's the, again just creating this this air of of equality at the D and D table, regardless of your real life skills. Yeah, and that's important. But I will I will readily admit that is one of my like hard stop. D and D role playing things is I can't play like a low low charisma character. I have to make my points and I have to make them semi articulately. <laughs> and if you want to stop me, you have to add the rolls. I'm not I like I'm not. I'll pretend to be dumb, but I'm not going to pretend to like miss things entirely. I wasn't trying to call you out, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like my current character is no charisma, but he makes a lot of very good articulate points, and that's not going to stop. So roll them dice. Right. Yeah. I'd say amongst the party, the party arguing amongst themselves, just let it be whatever it is. Right. People say what they say. No rolls there because rolling against the party is weird. But yeah. like, I mean, well, uh, yeah, to your point, well, with your character, I've, I've had you make persuasion checks against NPCs. Yeah. No, and I, that's even though, good. yeah. And then you look and you're like, why didn't I have the paladin do this? <laughs> <laughs> Then we like have to lean on the paladin. It's like, oh, I would have never thought of any of that, but 27. <laughs> <laughs> I take mild offense to that. I just didn't get to the exact same conclusions. And I don't know. It's fun. Um, one more point on the skilled thing. Yeah. I think we're about to move on for that. Yeah. Um, don't forget about feats. There's the skilled feat. Gain proficiency in three additional skills. Ooh, is that any? <laughs> any huh? skills? Yep. Oh. So, uh, you, if you want to play this, this is the combination to do if you want to just fill in every bubble on the skill. Yeah, tree. yeah, yeah. Half elf, so you get the two bonus ones. Start rogue, and you get your four. Then go into bard to get one. Take a background to fill in the rest. Then at level four or whatever, take the skilled feat and get an additional three. Great. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this is it. You are the skill monkey. You have done it. Now, convince me. Why? That's the hard part. Why are you so good at absolutely everything? Role playing wise? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. That's a big old deep I, side. I, yeah. <laughs> like, like, the default is just, oh, just natural talents. I yeah. don't know. Just, but like, that's not that's not interesting. No, it also gets a little bit ridiculous. So in yeah. real life, this is, this is the big issue because this kind of uh, nature of a person reflects really heavily of extremely high intelligence. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it, you're not going to have high intelligence with this multi-class, most likely, realistically, but that would be the explanation in real life. In this, I don't know, you're just kind of lucky. You're blessed. You're incredible at learning things. Yeah. Intelligence isn't IQ in D&D. 
So, you know, you can have like an IQ of like 150 and have an intelligence of 11. How about that? I don't know. There's nothing that says your ability to learn is directly reflected by your intelligence in this game. Correct. But, you know, one thing is you can, I would personally um, make intelligence one of my higher stats because with this build, you need dexterity and you need charisma. Those are the only two. Both need to be 13. Both are fantastic skills to have Mm -hmm. high, especially when you're a bard. Spellcasting modifier is your charisma. That's fine. That's all great. Um, So, you know, you've got some room to play around with your stats. If you want to make intelligence above average, you're not going to get it to 20, probably, but or not for any good reason, at least. Uh, <laughs> you can. Um, but, you know, it's it's a good one to increase as well for an explanation. You know, I'm, I am reasonably smart. I've got a 14 intelligence, so that's above average. You know, it's it starts it. It puts you on the path of, of it making some sense. Yeah. And that's still just a mechanic way to explain it. Right. <laughs> but, yeah, why are you good at this? It's like... Anybody who really sets out and devotes themselves to learning shit, they're going to learn it. Yeah. A lot of people, most people just, they don't care if they're good at fly fishing and knitting. (laughs) I I don't. Yeah, Yeah, that's fair. I could give it a week and I probably could become better than 99% of people at fly fishing. But I'm not going to. No, I think that's actually a really good point is there are a lot of uh, skills and hobbies that I'm not going to say you just pick up and you just learn and you're good at. Of course not. But there are a lot of things that you start, you put two weeks into and you go, oh, okay, I understand this at least. Yeah, they compare. Yeah, like week or two. And if you compare yourself to people who were like you previously, just not interested at all, there's a large gap there. the, The best example I have right now is miniature painting. (laughs) <laughs> um, I'm not amazing by any means, but I am much better than a random person you'd pick off the street and say, Hey, use this tiny brush to paint this thing. Yeah. Because I spent, I mean, three weeks. The doing best it. example is I'm much better than Jared was three weeks ago. You know, in your case at what you are much better oh, than Jared. Oh, three weeks ago. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Cause he exactly. did it. So maybe you just have a lot of hobbies. <laughs> and I actually yeah, think it's, it's just, yeah, it's like living life with the goal of just learning as much as you can. Right. Anytime right. one of those weird random things come up, hey, a bunch of us are going fly fishing. And I'm not really, that's not my thing. Right. You just Did go, this character go, yeah, absolutely. Sweet. It sounds great. Teach do, do, you have, do you have a book you could give me? I'll read up on it before we go. Yeah. So those are the two things I'd say, um, you know, you want to be uh, an avid reader, this character. I'd expect yes. that, um, which offers tons of role playing just things to pop up you get into a city what's the first thing you do i go find some books give me some random books i want to learn shit great yeah um and just like picking up a new hobby every week you find an npc and you go into it's like a rare artifact store and they're like i don't know carving wood and you're like cool i want to carve wood how do you do that let me ask questions like there's so much fun to be had with that yeah. role playing wise yeah and I, I i don't like bards and rogues for personal reasons i really <laughs> want to know these personal reasons they're just illogical it's like every time they are at the table they frustrate me as a player when they're next to me i'm like stop that stop doing stuff every bards, turn. Though? stop doing like three things every turn <laughs> that like frustrates me as a warlock <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to put it. As an avid fan of Warlocks, I don't like somebody being able to do more than Eldritch Blast. <laughs> Not to mention, they are always competition for me as the party face. It's like, oh, ooh, we're like neck and neck on charisma. But I'm <laughs> kind of a creepy guy. And do you like being the party face? I can't. I like. I struggle to resist being the party face. <laughs> okay, because that's something I noticed. Like with our our group, like both of us are trying to be the party face a lot of times. Uh, I don't think yeah. we actually are trying to be the party face. I like, I do, I want to say it really is role playing. Mm-hmm. You've got your weird, dumb paladin. Yeah. Who and just, I've got my weird, dumb cleric and we just keep yelling, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. But yeah, the other day I really had to stop myself because, uh, it, back on this duplication magic, cause we've been dealing with this for three to four weeks now. Um, we were talking about like giving away, uh, like, oh, like maybe we can spare this woman's life by, uh, telling the government that she knows this incredibly secret magic that can give them tons and tons of power and, you know, she can work for them. And like, I knew I'm sitting there and I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But like, you know, (laughs) my paladin's dumb and really thinks that like the world is a good place. So like you, you called it out as 
your character and you're like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I just like had to sit there and like not stop things and be like, guys, I don't actually think that by the way. <laughs> I was like, let's just let it play out. It's fine. Everybody thinks I'm an idiot. It's like, no, I'm, I'm really trying to like role play this out. My right. character is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, I know I've struggled with that with characters. You have one playing characters as well, doing or saying something where I, Kevin, don't believe that's the best course of action or yeah that's really extreme and whatever but it fits in character right and like really biting my tongue of having as everyone yells at me for being really dumb like, right no, i know that <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to take us out of the session I, know right. that. <laughs> I just want like a post-it note to hold up and say i'm role-playing <laughs> <laughs> and so i i think that's the like uh, the beautiful middle ground of really good inter-party role-playing is you when you have idiots at the table who are idiots, uh, I, I don't, when you have idiots in the game who are not idiots at the table, somebody has to in character call them out or shit's just going to get really dumb. Right. <laughs> but you can't rely on people who are just like using their normy intelligence to be like, oh, that's really dumb. In, in in America's democracy, that's not how it works. We're not in America's democracy. <laughs> I can shoot force bolts out of this stick I bought at a store. <laughs> I can call down a flame sphere. A flame sphere. You know how much a flame sphere costs in the United States of America? It's like eighty thousand dollars. I can do that four times a day. <laughs> You have to get in that mentality where you are calling out your uh, party members in a role play way. Right. So things don't get out of hand, but you also can't be relying on the real world. Right, right. But I think you your character has a, uh, has defined himself as anti-establishment. That has not been like a new thing, uh, which is definitely pulling some from from uh, from some internal places. Besides the point, though, uh, you know, you, you you've played up on that. So, like, I know that I basically I know that I am free to say stupid stuff like that because I know your character is going to continuously shoot it down. Yeah, which I, is kind of nice. It just at some I point, like that fake wisdom. Uh, it's you're wise. That is the thing. Yeah. Hey, Saucy's lived for 135 years as a dwarf. And your societies he disagrees with. That's like, great. That's great role playing. Right. And yeah, it's it's tough to do that. And I think skill monkeys are a great example of something that if you role play it right, is phenomenal at the table. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, this is one of the, we've, we've only gotten to the skill monkey part and there's like still stuff <laughs> to talk about. We're going to have a rogue bar part too, I, I promise you. Um, but you yeah, know, like. We got the, time. <laughs> good. Um, I, oh, I lost my train of thought. Um this is one of the first characters or PC combinations that uh, it's like, I, I would want to play this. This sounds like a really fun character idea of just being good at everything. I don't know. Yeah. I, it, it's, I, I kind of view skills as like a, a secondary thing a lot of times, but like there's a lot of really fun ways to play this up. For sure. Um, all right. Any <laughs> other thoughts on skills? Because man, we can talk about that forever. Final thought, it is, uh, I think every character, every player who starts D&D is always addicted to the idea of being good at everything. And you have to kind of let that go in every combination, except for this one. Except for this one. <laughs> if you want to sate that addiction you've had since day one, here's your chance. But I think it takes a, um, like a, a, a good role player to actually make it work beyond just, I don't know, I'm good at it. <laughs> It's not fun. Yeah, it's right. not exciting. It's not interesting. Um, it's it's doable. It's right here. All the mechanics are here. But uh, you got to really make that your your character. And you can do it easy. It's easy to do. It's fun. Yeah. All right. Um, subclass specifics. I love the idea of a college whisper assassin. Awesome. We came yeah. up with different ones. Ooh. Go for okay. it. Okay. Yeah. So the <laughs> college whispers is the bar thing where they're, they're all like undermined and they're kind of spies like magical spies is really what it comes down to uh rogue assassin is should be pretty self-explanatory and also just right in the player's handbook they are assassins Woo. um it, it's it's really just for one move mantle of whispers what you get do? at sixth level so there's specific mechanics of how this happens of like you steal their shadow and can use it later but essentially when you kill somebody you can morph into them for oh, oh shoot how long i should one hour yeah and this is not like uh, disguise self with an illusionary thing rather than hold up to physical inspection or anything like that. You literally morph into this person. You gain their basic memories. 
and any information that they would willingly share of kind of like acquaintances and stuff, you just know it. And you so, get a plus five bonus to your insight and deception checks while you're disguised like that. Yes. Oh my God. It's think about how great that would be for an assassin. Yeah. <laughs> I'm it, just trying to think of a time when that's actually worthwhile. What no, do you mean? Like infiltration? No, no, no. no, no. Uh, in, a, in a party setting. That sounds great if you're a single player who is tasked to assassinate somebody. But as a party, that's like... All right, so let's say different. you're infiltrating a keep. Um, there's okay. the Baron of the keep who's evil and you need to take him out. And your whole party's doing it. And you managed to be somewhat stealthy up to this point. You're, you're within the inner holes. Um, you need to get to the main room and there's heavy guards. And you know there's... If you just approach it, they're going to... The fighting's going to be on their turf. Um, so you, the College of Whispers assassin, sneaks off around a little bit, and you shank a guard in the kidneys with your dagger and kill them. And as they fall to the ground, you physically morph into them as their memories stream into your head. You hide their body, and then you enter into that main area as this guard with all of with the majority of their memories fully being able to pass off as them. You could get to wherever you need to go, free movement around, set up whatever you need. Uh, maybe initiate combat that way by you get close to this Baron in the keep and you get your surprise attack off. Um, so it would be they would be surprised. It would be at advantage and it would be at a critical with a sneak attack. OK, and then the. They get something where, yes, yeah, psychic blades. Uh, when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can expend one use of your bardic inspiration to deal an extra 2d6 damage, and that goes up. So it's kind of almost like a mini sneak attack, which you could then do on top of your regular sneak attack, which, again, because you're an assassin, you just critted. So the 2d6 becomes 4d6, and then, you know, your whatever your handful, the 6d6 sneak attack becomes 12d6. So now you're rolling 16d6. All right, and that's your right. first Sorry, round my, of combat. My fingers can only move so fast for this calculator. Um, <laughs> so that's, okay. You're, you're good, but I, I hate to say it, you did not answer my question. How does this work in a party? In a I, party, I got it, that, that starts <laughs> combat. You if, do that against the high-value target. Okay. This, is, this is a thing. But they're we, not in there. You infiltrated it alone. All right. No, no, well, no, no, you're no, no, kind no. of... Go on, Will. What are you going to say? So this is a thing we don't do because, I don't know, we're kind of like biased against rogues, and we don't have <laughs> a lot of them. But if you are fighting pure monsters, Out of the Abyss is a good example of something... We would not have had a lot of use for that. Correct. Kind of thing. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. yeah. But if you are in like a high intrigue campaign with a lot of humans, like you're running right now. Yep. That's a great starter. Oh, yeah. 16 D6 Dan. This, this is all right. <laughs> just like to <laughs> interrupt myself, level, yeah. just to interrupt myself. This is the bard rogue bullshit where they're like, oh, let me pull out every dice on the table. It's like, why are you rolling all the. I didn't. You know what? I don't care. All right. You do that much damage. Go for it. Count them up. Count them up. I'm bored. Count them up. Um, but yeah, no, this is, this is, this is how you open up combat with, uh, human intrigue enemies. This okay. really, really lends itself to city campaigns and various intrigue stuff. Right. Right. Um, I think you can also do a, a decent job of just maybe ignoring the the combat if if it's not expected to be like a a powerful wizard or whatever like somebody that's just like this is the lord of the realm and they need to be assassinated they don't need to be specifically powerful you could always just have them killed in their sleep yes yeah um you know just for for flavor reasons because we've talked about yeah. this before but you were asking how do you get the party involved and he's Correct. they need to be powerful and this needs to trigger combat and that's your opening move okay so, so yeah, let me let me surprise. turn this just a little bit let me tweak one little bit um you say you shank the guard so great you dispose of his body and then as the guard you go hey uh they're here to see you and then you just bring all your party in. Sure. That's all that. I need. That's all I need. Because otherwise, it just there's a lot of opportunities for you to run in there and take care of things yourself uh, or initiate things yourself. Uh, but unless you like actively do something to bring your party along, it's like just kind of you doing things yourself. Which everybody, if you know, if you're tasked with the mission of you need to assassinate this person, everyone's going to look at the rogue and be like, this is your time to shine. <laughs> Great. Let them shine by initiating things, doing all everything that you just said, which right. would be catastrophic to anything that you don't give a pool of HP that is similar to a dragon's. But, <laughs> you know, it's like you need to do something to make your party involved. 
Yeah. Otherwise, Which, you it, get people at the table, like Will, who are like, hey, Bard Rogue, fuck you. <laughs> Wait, your party would still get involved pretty quick. It's like, so Depending. the party could even take care of the guard together. Yeah. You know, you're kind of, I kind of see it as you're like, you're off in a quiet area of the cats, like, you know, broom closet or something waiting just down the hall here. Then you send the rogue in to do this. And that, that takes literally no time, like but play time. Right. Um, quick role play, you know, a couple conversations to get into the door. And then when they're in there, they, they do their attack. And then that triggers the party to bum rush in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Because right. then at that point, like, everybody's be a highly oiled assassination. <laughs> All right, what's step two? A bum rush, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna bum rush him. Well, think of it. So they, the guy stabs the Baron or the bodyguard who's really powerful or whoever, and then all the guards on the outside rush in, and then your party comes in behind them where they're all focused that way. No, I mean, yeah, it's kind that's, of a that's flanking it, thing. Yeah, it's it should not be this. I killed the king, and now everybody's my subject. That's that's <laughs> generally not how it works. <laughs> so. I'm the king. I'm the king now. <laughs> like well, he said it, and he killed the guy, and he's got the crown on. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I owe that, that rogue ball. <laughs> I hear he's really good at, like, way too many things. <laughs> um, can you only do this, uh, I'm assuming it says at the end here, once per long rest? Short or long rest? Short or long yeah. rest. Interesting. Um, In terms I, of the damage, <laughs> so what, what I was saying about... Long. So uh, the... Um, That's where you're wrong. <laughs> Sorry, that, though, the, the mantle of whispers is... Oh, no, I was looking at the wrong thing. Oh, it, yeah, it is still short or long rest, but... Uh, the, the mantle whisper saying the getting that like, 16 d6 sneak attack damage that's actually separate from it that i was just saying that's yeah kind of additional because you do the psychic blades yep with your sneak attack and yep. then if you manage to crit but would you crit off being an assassin everything right, doubles but, yeah. yeah of course all the ways to get crits um but it's it's actually not that crazy amount of damage most likely you're probably not going to be at 16 d6 because at what point do you get 66 for sneak attack it's already getting up there uh 11th level Okay, yeah. And then, so that's already getting it up there. So it'll probably be less. But even if you do 16d6, the maximum, if you, you roll all sixes, is 96 damage. The average is 55. It's a lot, but that's not encounter ending. It's enough to kill a burhag in one go. It is sure. enough. Or <laughs> a displacer beast. <laughs> but I'm just thinking like a paladin who... Right. Uh, uh, all right, and a level 11 paladin. Um, and actually, you get psychic blades at third level... So that'd be 14. So the level 14 paladin and the level 14, is that what I said? A level 14 paladin mm-hmm. running in with a gray weapon master minus five plus 10 damage hits, gets a crit because this is also banking on getting a crit and then doing their top level smite. And then they get to attack a second time. Right. I and mean, the damage, it, yeah, it's comparable. It's so as we've, I think we talked about it off air. Um, paladins for me are always kind of the base like when you're talking about these multi-class combinations like oh look at all that damage all right well let's just kind of go back to just a standard player handbook paladin right and see how it compares and not much beats it <laughs> and it's such a reliable level because the paladin can keep doing it can keep doing it and the only uh setup is it needs to hit yeah or you know crit that's right. happens pretty frequently compared to this where we're kind of throwing a lot of well yeah. i guess it's really just the same when it crits yeah but it needs to be on the first turn no it doesn't matter it needs sneak attack and it needs to crit which yeah it needs right, then if it's an assassin rise. yeah if it's an assassin it's surprised to crit so where this comes in is when you you know if you just run in and initiate combat it's going to be really hard for the paladin to get to that target because they have defenses in place or whatever this needs to be this is the best chance we have to get somebody actually next to that target to hit them which the paladin is not good at doing yeah no totally and uh, I, I actually question, because the assassin, especially with the College of Whispers, which we focused on way too much, but <laughs> it is actually a good idea. Yeah. It totally overrides all the higher level stuff, more or less, for the assassin okay. subclass. So you are just essentially chasing sneak attack, sneak attack dice. Yeah. And that's, I don't know, that's mixed effectiveness to me. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, the the assassin, the higher level assassin was being disguise yourself with things, right? Yeah, and but that's more the crazy death. Is there any limit on that? No. Okay, I, so that's the difference. So when it's re- really you know first time for the day, or when it's like really critical mantle whispers, and then that's your use of it. Then you still have the just the old fashioned not magical disguise to fall back on. It's Cape also you know you have to spend twenty five gold in a day to like 
understand that these guys have mustaches. And now I have oh, a mustache. Oh, really? It's a, yeah, okay. Yeah. There's some sadness. Oh, at that point, then you can just do way mantle. too role play. All right. <laughs> I guess we're forgetting morality. Mantle of Whispers requires you to kill someone. <laughs> It's a barred road, yeah. Kevin. If you think they're going to hesitate to kill even children, you're wrong. <laughs> Anybody who plays bards and rogues, just psychopaths. Who Absolute hurt psychopaths. You, you yeah. warlock freak. <laughs> bards and rogues. <laughs> Kevin's bards. He it's, never they, gave we're me. We're always good guys. He never yep. gave me inspiration. <laughs> or what? Mm, no, I used cutting words. Well, yeah, yeah, once you go yeah, lore you and you have them. cutting words, that's usually the better use of those dice because it's limited he never protected me with cutting words i'm pretty sure i did it was really maybe me. not you I was specifically actually, yeah because you were an evil asshole yeah and i called it from the beginning holy shit <laughs> all right guys. all right guys. <laughs> we've already went into this <laughs> win did nothing wrong all right <laughs> <laughs> all right what was your uh um oh i i was just going to ask what your favorite class is is it bard oh. you've played a lot of bards but we always just kind of joke that yeah. bard's your favorite <laughs> probably yeah okay Okay, so we got a warlock and a bard fan. Huh. What is your favorite class, Jared? I don't have one. Yeah, no, I don't. I actually think I'm. I think you're a paladin guy. I think I'm a paladin guy. <laughs> <laughs> I love paladins. This is a but, table of cringe, guys. Oh come on! Warlocks, Everybody has their... bards, and paladins. What's uh, wrong with that? Nothing. Is it yeah. all great? So um, try. Hard. Has it any worse than fighters, monks, and rangers? See, I, I also will say that <laughs> no I, one it, likes rangers. <laughs> I like the flavor of them. Yeah, same here. I haven't been able to play every single class. No, I haven't so, played every class. You know, there, there might be things that creep up, but from yeah. a mechanical standpoint, paladins are where it's at. They get some spell casting, but for the most part, they're just exploding damage. And uh, I don't know. That's all I got so far. <laughs> <laughs> I like their auras a lot. Yeah. They just they just feel good to play. They're, just, they're a solid class. Right, right. That's, that's really it. Yeah. There's, I, I've played some classes that... Like, you know, I just get through them and I'm like, ugh, this just doesn't feel good. And that's all I have to it. We're like, just, I have to keep sacrificing things. But Paladin, I'm like, hey, I can help here. I can do this. Ah, yay. I'm yeah. versatile. Yeah. Um, but, all right. So, when it comes to subclasses that I thought of, um, I really liked the College of Swords. Yes. Um, I thought really that one was extremely good. They get uh, a lot of really... Well, one, they get a fighting style, which is really nice. You can get uh, the dueling, which is when you have a melee weapon in one hand, you gain a plus two bonus to damage rolls with that weapon. Just nice. Um, most likely as a rogue and a bard, you're going to be using the da -da -da -da, the rapier. Uh, so <laughs> that's one handed. Uh, you get some extra damage to it. Uh, but more importantly, their main thing is the blade flourish, uh, which is a much better use of bardic inspiration than, uh, you know, as, as you were saying, adding just plus eight to somebody's roll or, or not plus oh, eight, one plus D8. one D eight or whatever the I think bardic inspiration die is. Kind of, yeah. Um, all of them are just fantastic options and give you more to work with from your, from your rogue side. Um, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like they increase just right from the start. Whenever you take the attack action on your turn, your walking speed increases by 10 feet. That's nice. It's just really good, especially for a rogue. You get your right. positioning. Uh, maybe you don't have to use your bonus action for dash, which does happen a lot. Um, then uh, it doesn't take a bonus action. It doesn't take a reaction. It doesn't take anything. Blade Flourish is just you took the attack action. You can Blade Flourish for free. Right. So you get your defensive one where you roll your Bardic Inspiration die, deal extra damage, add it to your AC. Great. Slashing Flourish. Flourish. Deal extra damage. Do it to people around as well. Anyone within, is it one other creature? Any other creature of your choice that you can see within five feet of you. Just dealing more damage. Great. Uh, the mobile is all right. Um, you can push the target up to five feet away from you. You get some some extra battlefield control, which I feel like Bard should really kind of focus on is the amount they can control the battlefield. Yeah. Um, so all three of those I just think are great. And level six, you get your extra attack. Uh, which we've discussed tons of times. As a rogue, anytime you can get a second attack, you get a second chance at sneak attack. So, fantastic. You know, you're just a well-rounded character. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Master's Flourish is the, the 14th level ability. Uh, it's just good. You can basically do a Blade Flourish every single time, uh, but use a D6 instead of expending a Bardic Inspiration die. So all around, I think the College of uh, Swords is just really good. 
Uh, yeah. But combined with the rogue getting that sneak attack damage, having all of your bonus actions still fully available to you, it's just fantastic. Uh, from a role-playing side, um, I think they also just go together really well. Um, yes, for sure. College of Swords talks a lot about how uh, this is, it's like a circus trope. That's that's mm-hmm. it there. And I use troop. that in the troop. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, it's a circus trope troop. <laughs> troop trope. There we go. We're circus just like troop, all the other trope. circuses. <laughs> We're the circus trope troop. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the Cir- College of Swords does rely on the circus trope troop trope. Ah, damn, that's hard. I'm trying to say it. I'm not doing a good job. Just move on. Uh, yeah, right. I'm doing it. <laughs> uh, so... You know, it can just be pretty easy there where uh, it's explaining that they deal in nefarious deeds such as assassination, robbery, and blackmail. That's the first thing I think like of when I think of Like all circus employees. Yeah. <laughs> like all circus employees. If we have any circus employees, stop listening. We all think you're assassins. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, I just alienated our circus assassin friends. Crap. <laughs> um, but, you know, they're entertainers. Uh, and they're entertainers who are good with the blade. So rogue comes up right away. Um, trying yeah. to think of a, a rogue subclass to pair with that. I don't think you're going to have any bad ones in particular besides the uh mastermind probably wouldn't be that great mastermind um what what's the main thing of mastermind help yeah it's more about yeah like manipulation and stuff like that mastermind of glamour meshes really well because they're kind of on the same thing yeah the mastermind you're you're a criminal mastermind you you're not really the one going out and doing the fighting you're it mastermind almost for it feels more like it's for an npc that's yeah that's fair whereas college of the swords you're saying is more of the person who does go yes. out and gets does the dirty work yeah yeah i like that yeah. so that, you're right that doesn't uh go over too well yeah um and then uh the what's the other one the arcane trickster doesn't mesh well with that because no, I, yeah i think yeah for whatever subclass you pick i think arcane trickster would be a poor choice <laughs> yes, for I agree. definitely for the bard because it just you get such limited spell casting and it's like the bard's gonna blow it out of the water yeah it's, hey you get some and, and then spells. you have to throw intelligence into the mix because yeah. that's their you like, have yeah. to as yes. opposed to you can just kind of flirt with it in all our other builds yeah uh yeah. swashbuckler works really well too. swashbuckler yeah. works it does um, inquisitive i think would yeah. be fun go ahead into that oh i i this is a i didn't have notes on this one i oh, didn't think about it till now but um yeah the, yeah, the inquisitive thing there are there are whole the insightful idea. fighting yeah the insightful fighting they're able to analyze a situation and then fight accordingly with that and they're very observant um and they can get yeah. uh, another way to get sneak attack which yeah. is always good where basically they they get it regardless as long as they um once they do that first check as a bonus action you can make a yeah. wisdom insight check yeah. against a creature uh if it fails it's just deception check that's so weird you do an insight it does a deception how strange yeah. Uh, it if tries succeed, to not <clears throat> reveal its true nature. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So if you succeed, you can use your sneak attack against that target, even if yeah. you don't have advantage on the attack roll. Just gives you another way to, yeah. to use and, that. And then you get bonuses to insight checks, perception checks, investigation checks, so on and so mm-hmm. on. And I think that just meshes well with uh, Bard, especially even just by name, Inquisitive Rogue. And then yeah. Bard's whole thing is they're finding ancient lores and they're digging into secrets. And it, I think that, that just role play wise meshes well. Combat, I don't know if it would stand out, but you wouldn't be bad because you still have all the base bard and the base rogue stuff right which both of them just base without their subclasses are They're good classes yeah. yeah i mean rogue you get your sneak attack yeah right? scales linearly we've talked about that before it's just good sneak yeah. attack is good yeah getting an extra attack in there is even better i think what are the other bard classes that valor and lore just Va- those valor two? is good so valor and lore are the original from the player handbook. no no, no. lore does not get an extra attack oh no no, no, no i'm sorry I, I thought you were just asking the no the yeah sorry uh Lore is good. Lore is a great subclass. For a magic user. So, yeah, in the player handbook, you had Valor and Lore, just the two. And basically, there are, it's just choosing what flavor of bard you want. Lore is when you want, you're a full caster, that is your focus. Valor is, you focus a lot on melee with upgrading things with casting. That That's kind of the idea there. Rogue is obviously full, you know, um, martial. And yep. I said Valor is melee. It's just, it's martial. You can do yeah. ranged as well. Yeah, yeah. But, um... So I think Valor fits really well with Rogue. Uh, same in the same sense that College of Swords does. A uh, lore I don't think fits too well with Rogue. It's lore is kind of amazing on its own, and if yeah. then you like you multi class dip into a Rogue, it's like you're it's not going to beat casting spells for a lore bard. 
It just waters it down. And then if you're high up in Rogue, you're not going to get much for a quick dip into lore. Yeah. No, that's yeah. fair. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> one thing, <laughs> level three ability bonus proficiencies for lore bard. You gain proficiency with three skills of your choice. Oh, oh come on. Uh, so if you're going for that skill monkey, you can just do a three level dip in bard and you're yeah. you're solid. You're yep. too solid. Stop yes. it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, it's too many. Um, the, the martial bard classes do pair super well. Um, in addition just because of uh you also get proficiency with medium armor which is always good as a rogue to raise that ac um as long as you're not taking one that gives you disadvantage in stealth that can be extremely worthwhile um both college of valor and college of swords give you proficiency in medium armor college of valor gives you proficiency in shields which i don't think there'd be a negative to taking a shield as a rogue that i, I think can so. think of no any of these builds benefit from a shield i guess yeah so, I mean, you can have a high AC, which, uh, I don't know, it's it's not the point of the class, but it's not a bad thing to have a high AC, right? Right. <laughs> no, I mean, it's never a bad thing <laughs> to be harder to hit. <laughs> Unless you have some weird masochist armor of Agathis kind of... Build. Build, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this has a lot of overlap. Yeah. In a good way, in yeah. a good way. I don't think they they step on each other at all which I, I like a lot. Right. Um, I don't know how much of a focus the spell casting is going to be from the bard, but bard spell casting is just good. Yeah, there's and, a lot of good stuff. Right. Like Not damaging. Correct. Utility and battlefield control. Right. And healing even, right? You get, they get... Um, yeah, they get cure wounds yeah, and which, stuff. Yeah, which... I'm just saying you have the... The Thank ability you. to. It's all nice. They get cure wounds. Now I'm doubting that. I know I had no. it, but that might have been a magical secret spec. Oh. Oof. Okay. Well, I'll let you deal with that. Uh, it's just good. You you got no, <laughs> no problems. Yeah, there's not a lot of limits on this one. No, I like it. I really do like it a lot. I think it'd be fun to play. Any combination outside, probably lore and outside arcane trickster. You really can do whatever you yeah. want. They do get cure wounds, by the way. Almost everything gets cure wounds. That was, I don't know. I doubted it. That is a lie. Paladins get cure wounds. Wizards yeah. don't. I said almost everything yeah, I know, gets. I know. Yeah. Which is kind of the irony. It's like I think wizards and sorcerers are the. I guess I still warlocks have, don't. Bards, clerics, druids, paladins, rangers, life domain, clerics. Get it for oh, free. Oh, every and then the celestial warlock. Yeah, that sounds about right. But yeah, so wizards, no. clerics, and sorcerers. That's like their big. Oh, clerics get it. Or no, wizards, sorcerers, and warlocks. warlocks. There you go. They don't heal. No, they better not. Unless you're celestial. <laughs> <laughs> um. That's all I got. Yeah, yeah I think we're that's all I got too. We're kind of far in time wise. I think we should move on. It's felt like a blink. You ready for yeah, that gibbering mouther? Yeah, for sure. I guess. But before we get into the gibbering mouther, once again, I'd like to discuss our Twitter, monsters underscore multi. Uh, that's that's all I'm going to say today. Just uh, give us a follow. We're not going to spend twenty minutes talking about it. Kevin might. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> all right oh, leave us a review wherever you can review things no stop we're all done right. it's ah, enough self-promotion you know in horror movies uh when the protagonist is running away at an extremely quick speed and they just keep looking behind them and see the bad guy about 30 feet back that is kind of like a gibbering mouther uh, the only difference is when you turn around, you don't see a guy in a hockey mask or a burn victim. Uh, you just see a mound of mouths and flesh uh, just whispering in your ear, uh, saying incoherent things uh, that absolutely break your mind. So <laughs> with the gibbering mouther, uh, it's, it's not going to kill you with its speed or with its... Uh, I, I guess, uh, intellect in any way. The gibbering mother terrifies you by hunting you down at a slow pace and turning you into a lifeless corpse through just breaking your mind and eating you. Then it absorbs your body. That was a weird way to say it kills you. It turns you into a lifeless corpse. <laughs> lifeless corpse. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it kills you. <laughs> you wake up dead. How are we going to justify <laughs> all these executions? We're just turning them into lifeless corpses, man. <laughs> it's a bit redundant. You yeah, got me yeah. there. <laughs> it kills you by doing 
<laughs> but I'm sorry. Overall, no, that was a really good intro. Much better than I ever do. Did you have more to say? <laughs> no. Jibbering Mouther. Let's get into it. Shit scary. Shit scary. Speed, 10 feet. <laughs> also, swim. It's 10 f- swim feed speed, 10 feet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 10 feet in six seconds? No. Even I can outswim that. That's, yeah. That's really yeah. bad. Yeah. Wait, didn't you swim in high school? I've swam in high school. Yeah. Okay, that's, yeah, I guess, whatever. Water is two-thirds of the planet, but. <laughs> <laughs> Jibbering Mouther is a, a challenge rating two. So it mm-hmm. seems like it's not going to be that big of a deal. Um, I think this is one that you, if you threw at a low level party, you can completely obliterate them. Yes. Uh, the only thing that it has against it is its low armor class. And its speed. And its speed. Yeah. 10 feet is very limited. Right. But like, uh, yeah, if you throw these things like an open forest, it's like, it's there, you're going to be able to kite it. Mm-hmm. But let's look at all of the uh, ways that it has to prevent you from moving, making its movement speed not a big deal. Um, Aberrant ground, which I might be mispronouncing. Uh, the ground in a 10-foot radius around the Mouther is a doe-like difficult terrain. Each creature that starts its turn in that area must succeed on a DC 10 strength saving throw or have its speed reduced to zero until the start of its next turn. So right away, you're finding a way to just completely stop the melee attackers from moving, uh, which maybe that's where they want to be. They want to be right next to it, right? Uh, except for gibbering. It's next just passive ability that it does not need to do as an action always happens yep uh each creature that starts its turn within 20 feet of the mouther and can hear the gibbering must succeed on a dc 10 wisdom save on a fail it can't take reactions until the start of its next turn and it rolls a d8 uh on a one to four the creature does nothing on a five or six creature takes no actions or bonus actions and tries to run away uh, no, seven or, no, randomly. Oh, sorry. In a randomly determined direction. You are correct. Very different than running away. It is. Uh, seven or eight, the creature makes a melee attack against a randomly determined creature within its reach or does nothing if it can't make such an attack. So it's already just controlling everybody around. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's low saves. I'll, I'll say that. The strength is 10, or the, the DC is 10 on the strength save. DC is 10 on the wisdom save. Overall, those aren't scary, but to a level two party, those are very failable things. Yes. It also got that flashbang spit. (laughs) It also has flashbang spit. Yeah, yeah, then it's attacks. Um, So first of all, bite, which is insane damage for a challenge rating two. So it's only a plus two to hit with a five foot reach. And it's not even done. Yeah. yeah, Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Plus two, five foot reach. Yeah, but if it hits, it's 5d6 piercing damage. Right. And And if if the target is medium or smaller, it must succeed on DC 10 strength save or be knocked prone. And if the target is killed by this damage, it is absorbed into the mouther. So when it says killed, does that mean knocked unconscious? Or no, no, it's saying when it's actually killed, right? Yeah. So it can't be revivified. It can't be pulled out. I mean, I, I have so many ways that you could like throw this against a party at the beginning and all of them are terrifying. I, like you're looking at a TPK essentially if, yeah. if you just throw this at someone. So it would be a really cool start to an adventure if you gave everybody like they, they came at you with their, their characters. They've built up level three or four characters. Everybody comes to the table for the first time. You hand them some level two characters and you say, hey, this is your mission. You're going into this cave. There's something going on in here. Check it out. And I would just have this thing absolutely obliterate the the level twos. <laughs> and then, like, the actual PCs, what they came with, get to come in and, like, save the day. Uh, but this thing is a horror monster through yes. and through. And I think that it, you got to use that to your advantage. Um, you know, they walk into a dungeon. And what's 10 feet behind you? The gibbering mouther. And maybe they run away at first because, I don't know, you just got to deal with it and like recognize that this thing ate somebody right away. Yeah. 5d6 is just crazy. Uh, I think there's just a lot of fun ways to, to use this. And the main way I'm hearing is just horror monster. Yeah. Any other ways that you guys are thinking of, of throwing this in? Why, yes, <laughs> I do have one. So they're kind of, they're basically abominations of slaughter and sorcery basically a lump of eyes and teeth made out of people who have been eaten by these eyes and teeth (laughs) so there is a base source i'm like in my head kind of picturing the baby 
gibbering mouther. Okay. That was created by some horrible experiment. There's right. one set of teeth, one set of eyes. Just kind of meh. <laughs> just like right. weird like that. But like I could see a sorcerer or evil wizard having like a basement full of these guys. Ooh. Uh, there's nothing that says that they join up and create like a giant gibbering mouther. But, but there's, there's no reason that says they don't. They can, yeah. <laughs> and uh, recently we uh, read a post from the angry DM, if that's correct, uh, about that double monster idea. Yeah, yeah. It's like how do you how do you make a boss that doesn't behave as a single action economy blowout where right. they can only do one thing. Legendary actions, one thing, but your party still wins. How about just basically a room that is like six gibbering mouthers? But you're saying combine them into one gibbering yes. mouther? Yeah, you know, okay, like I got that. you. Yeah, Creating a big monster out of that. They've got that AOE, and uh, honestly, I would increase. I would increase the DC on every single thing they've got if they're all in this weird network of horror. Right. So basically what you're saying is you can easily change this from a challenge rating 2 to a challenge rating 10 with very little work. Exactly. You just treat it as, as six of them or however many, five of them. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a, a really good way to do it. Um, would you change the, the blinding spittle at all? Would you give it the ability to recharge that more frequently? Um, which I think should be explained. I I would give it to uh, I would give it to all of them. That would totally override that. I give it a same DC, uh, higher DC for all the other stuff. But blinding spittle, being blind sucks. Yeah, mm-hmm. I watched the movie uh, Ray, and that seemed like it was terrible. <laughs> I haven't. He seen couldn't that. see anything. What is that about? The guy who plays piano, Ray Charles. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay, that's what I was. He couldn't see at all. That seems like it's bad. <laughs> I see stuff almost all the time. All right. Yeah. But <laughs> mechanically speaking, it's also catastrophic. All right. Um, it's so the the blinding spittle is a recharge five or six, which means uh, you know it, it can do it as long as it's charged up. Once it uses it, it goes away. You have to roll a d6 at the start of its turn. Uh, if you roll a five or six, you can do it again. Uh, the mouther spits a chemical glob at a point it can see within 15 feet of it. The glob explodes in a blinding flash of light on impact. Each creature within 5 feet of the flash must succeed on a DC 13 dex saving throw or be blinded until the start of the mouther's next turn. So, if you're saying that you're going to give 6 of those uh, at the start, that's going to be really rough. They're basically, it can be assumed that they'll be fighting at disadvantage on on every single attack here. Yeah, and that I think that's the biggest downfall. The spittle with this multi, uh, multi monster is <laughs> that's just, being blind sucks in real life <laughs> and D and D flat out. Yeah, and if your players have to deal with like five of those coming at them every flip and turn, that's gonna suck. There are of course always ways around it though, because you can make things that don't make an attack roll. Uh, if you're doing sacred flambe. Uh, that's a you have to wisdom saving throw. You you can't see it at all. Oh, yeah, you're blind. No, that's that's fine. <laughs> you're right, but you're right that that doesn't even work there. Um, what do you do? I cast fireball into the void. It's right. Like, that's that's uh, it. Being blind sucks in real life in D and D. Okay. <laughs> I'm just making like think how much you you're see, right. man. You're right. You're right. It would really suck if I was in a room and I saw this thing. This hunk of flesh and if we're saying there's six of them together we're talking i don't know eight feet tall of just mouths and murmuring and just flesh spilling out and then it's like hey close your eyes (laughs) no no i don't want to do that boy i sure wish i could see right now said everyone in the room with a shivering master times five like what are you doing uh i swing my fucking sword and i just keep on trying to hit it well you can't see also the ground's made out of dough now yeah <laughs> uh would you increase the radius on that oh yeah yeah if ever in ground is we're saying either I-, I would spread the uh enemies out like we kind of s- discussed in the multi-monster kind of thing where it creates the entire room they all have this radius that covers it all right but if it was huge i would definitely up the radius yeah that's fair i i, I wouldn't make it too much bigger to be honest like i wouldn't you know say no it's 50 feet that's, that's too much that's just right. too much but yeah. like 15 would be good 15 yeah. maybe 20 uh up those uh those dcs um by a little bit this is a, a really really terrifying thing to fight and it's fun yeah, and it's it's again um versatile in the sense of well actually it's not that versatile i take that back uh, you're, you're really gonna stumble upon it that's it 
you're going to stumble upon it. You're going to be told to go kill this thing. I can't think of a, a time when you're going to uh, see this in a political intrigue campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to kill my opponent. Well, who, who's your opponent? <laughs> well, that's a gibbering mouth. Or, um, <laughs> how are you 15 points behind? He makes a lot of good points. He makes a lot of nonsense ones, but simultaneously. Yeah, I get that. I'm with that. Yeah. <laughs> I like that the ground is dough. <laughs> They just do an entire satire campaign of the political process. Where yeah. The gibbering mouth is literally gibbering to him just as well. I feel like there's a metaphor there. Yeah, uh, probably. Nah, it's just, it's just a scary monster. Not on Monsters in Multiclass. <laughs> we don't believe in metaphors. <laughs> you know, I, I like him. I think he's good. Uh, I think he's good for frustrating lower level players in kind of a fun way. Yeah, you yeah. Can't move. You can't see. Right. He can't really move. He's not that threatening until he is, and then yeah. he's really threatening. Yeah. And then you know, if he does kill you, you are absorbed into him, and your eyes and mouth bubble <laughs> up to the fleshy surface to join into the. Oh. And then if if you wanted to get it kind of sad and dark, you do his role playing with an NPC of like recognizing like her husband's eyes and the. Yeah, yeah, you definitely yeah. see that. Mm. Uh, My husband. Oh, that's too sad. Pushing her into the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um. This is a a monster that i would throw at a low level party like if we're saying challenge rating two, send it right at them to uh set a tone it is a tone setting monster where you mm -hmm. walk in you have this fight this is not fighting some level one or two goblins that you're like haha they're so dumb slash 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 all good this is like no this D is gonna be tough today guys and this isn't <laughs> stopping this is just the start um yeah, this, this would have been a good one for you to throw at us for Out of the Abyss. <laughs> Not that it would have yeah, made sense, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, for the, again, that tone I setting. I get it, yeah. Oh, uh, I love it. I gotta use one of these. Yeah. Anything else? We got a bunch of minis of those. Yeah, we did. We got like three or four. Yeah. Um, yeah, we did. The minis We're doing a cool. giveaway for it. We're not doing no. a giveaway no. for it. <laughs> <laughs> if you want some giants, though. <laughs> oh, there's so many giants. There actually is a picture of that on Twitter. I, yeah. I took that and, and posted it because we got so, so many giants. Yeah. Oh, man, though. <laughs> so many gibbering mouthers. Yeah. And a lot of giants. This was Mo Monster Menagerie 3. I don't know why it's all giants. <laughs> I don't know either. Um... But, it's but a, if you yeah. were going to ever do uh, the multi monster gibbering mouther, uh, you could just put like four of them in a in a little cube and just work off that to start. We've got the minis for it. Heck, I think we have five, so you could even put like one upside down in it, so they like kind of stack like a pyramid because they're kind of. You shouldn't do that though. That's right. dumb. That's. <laughs> <laughs> all right how about we just super glue them together yeah all right yeah no that's not a permanent solution to a temporary <laughs> problem <laughs> well yeah no i uh I, I like gibbering mouthers i also like that podcast or not that podcast the, the angry blog DM. post the angry dm yeah i thought that was a good idea the multi-monster monster creating two out of one it's interesting. We'll probably post a link somewhere. Yeah, that, that, that definitely deserves a link. Uh, and I think this is a great example of a monster. It's like, oh, shit. There's a basement full of gibbering mouthers. Mm -hmm. What has this wizard been doing? Well, we have to get to the other side. That's going to be a fun, scary encounter for even higher level parties. It'd be fun to explain as well. Like, you walk into the basement and you just see, like, it as a, a puddle almost. Because it's just, like, all spread across the ground seems like it's moving like a, a wave because it's so dough like and squishy. Uh, and then they one locks with you and just forms into this massive mound. And there you go. You got your giant gibbering mouther. It also behooves the monster to be able to make more noise with more mouths. <laughs> like imagine how much gibbering would be going on. <laughs> so much. That's the one thing that drives it. Not the, uh, the murder and, and slaughter like it, explains it's not a murder or slaughter you're right mouther. it's it's a gibbering mouth it just wants to gibber <laughs> uh all right anything else nope all right. all right uh then that's all we got thanks for listening thanks say goodbye will see you later next week on monsters and multiclass join us next week as we discuss the bard ranger multiclass and hags Part one, two, three. Well, I guess not all three at once. It's, it's just going to be part three. Um, yeah, join us. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>